Good evening, everyone. My name is John Taves, and I'm the event coordinator here at McNally Robinson Booksellers. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is Treaty 1 territory. That's the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, in the homeland of the Métis Nation. In addition, McNally Robinson Booksellers itself rests on the land once occupied by the Métis community of Rooster. We are gathered here tonight to celebrate a new book from somebody you may be familiar with. That book is, of course, The Future is Now, Solving the Climate Crisis with Today's Technologies, and the author in question is Bob McDonald of CBC's Quirks and Quirks. You may applaud dramatically. <laughs> We are so grateful to Penguin Random House Canada and, of course, Viking Books for publishing this book and for making this event possible. We're also delighted to be co-presenting this with our good friends at the Winnipeg International Writers Festival as part of Thin Air 2022. You'll be hearing from festival director Charlene Deal later on in the evening, but I would preemptively encourage you, if you have not already, to visit their website and check out the wide variety of offerings they have this year. I won't take up too much of your time right now. I just have a few quick procedural notes and I have to turn off my phone, which has just begun ringing, which is a terrible look for an event coordinator. So if you have not already, please do silence your phones. <laughs> now, just to give you an idea of what will happen, uh, in just a few minutes, Bob will come up here and he'll have a presentation for you. Following the presentation, there'll be an opportunity for all of you to ask questions. If you're watching online, please also feel free to write your questions in the chat and we'll put them to Bob as time permits. Uh, now, I will be embracing my inner Phil Donahue or Sally Jesse Raphael and running around the crowd with this wireless microphone just to make sure that everybody can hear your question when you actually offer it. That may have dated me. So, uh, please, thank you very much for your patience in that regard and do not be afraid if I suddenly thrust this in front of your face. Immediately following the event, we'll be moving along to the book signing portion of the evening. Uh, just for future reference, that signing will take place at a table just beside our cash desk. At that point, you'll be able to get in line, have a copy of tonight's book signed. We also have copies available for sale at the cash desk. Please do feel free to have a copy signed before you pay for it. Please do pay for the book. Also, I'll point out that I'll be wandering up and down the line to write down your names on a post-it note as well, so do not be surprised by that. That's just to ensure you can spend a little bit more time chatting rather than spelling your name when you actually get to the signing table. So thank you in advance. The only other thing I will say about signing before I actually get to the exciting part of tonight's event is that we will ask you all just to remain in place for one moment at the end of the event, and that is just so we can safely transport Bob over to the signing table, <laughs> at which point you may all descend. But Again, we are here to celebrate the book, The Future Is Now. And in this book, Bob turns his focus to global energy sources and shows how the global shutdowns we experienced during the global pandemic may have been exactly what we needed to show that a greener future is achievable. Bob McDonald has been the host of CBC Radio's Quirks and Quirks since 1992. He is a regular science commentator on CBC's News Network and a science correspondent for CBC TV's The National. His book, Measuring the Earth with a Stick, was shortlisted for the Canadian Science Writers Association Book Award. He has been honored with the 2001 Michael Smith Award for Science Promotion from the National Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, Natural Sciences, the 2002 Sanford Fleming Medal from the Royal Canadian Institute, and the 2005 McNeil Medal for the Public Awareness of Science from the Royal Society of Canada. In November 2011, he was made an Officer of the Order of Canada. Please join me in welcoming Paul McDonald. Oh, well, thank you, John. That was really wonderful. Can you tell he worked in radio? <laughs> before? No, that's really great. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming out tonight. Uh, let me just do a little, a little test before we begin. Close your eyes just for one second. Just close your eyes. Hello, I'm Bob McDonald. Okay, now you know who I am, right? Okay, I'm the guy on the radio. Now you know what I look like. And it's great to be back here in Winnipeg. Although I was a little shocked when I got off the plane last night. When I got on the plane, it was 18 degrees. When I got off the plane, dressed like this, <laughs> zero degrees and snow. Holy cow. Anyway, 
Always good to be back and great to be back here in this wonderful bookstore. I launched my last book here, uh, An Earthling's Guide to Outer Space, and it's always just terrific. And I also noticed that uh, everyone here, a lot of you, dye your hair gray like I do. <laughs> Welcome to the club, huh? You know, I had, a, I had an elderly couple over for dinner the other night, and uh, after dinner, the husband said, uh, you know, we went to a really good restaurant the other night. You should check it out. I said, sure, what's it called? And he went, oh, uh, oh he said, what do you call that flower, that red flower with the thorns that you give to someone when you like them? I said, a rose? And he turned to his wife and he said, Rose, what's the name of the restaurant we went to the other night? <laughs> okay. Anyway, out of the book. I, uh, I wrote this book because I was getting depressed. As a journalist, I've been reporting on the environment since 1977. That was my first job at the CBC, was to do a documentary on climate change. And back then it was called running hot and cold because there were two branches of science that were arguing with each other. One branch, the geologists were saying, you know, we've had five ice ages and between the ice ages are these warm periods that last about 10,000 years. Well, there's been 12,000 years since the last ice age, so we're overdue. It should get cold. But the climatologists were saying, yeah, but there's these new things called greenhouse gases that we're putting into the atmosphere, and that's going to override that. So it was a debate back in the 70s. Well, we know who won that debate. And the other thing that's happened is that the climate change, when I was reporting on it back then, was in the future. But it's not anymore. It's here. It's now. We're seeing it with the hurricanes and all the damage that's happening and the droughts and the water shortages and the loss of ice in the Arctic, the loss of species and habitat. And boy, you know, it's all bad news. And I don't want to diminish the seriousness of that. It is serious. But I started thinking, OK, instead of pointing to the problem, which we've been doing for decades, what are the solutions? How are we going to get ahead? How are we going to get rid of these carbon emissions without breaking the economy, without destroying our lifestyle, and, and get ahead? And to my delight, when I started researching for this book, I found that all of the technology to go green already exists. There are no new inventions needed to go to a carbon-free economy. It's all out there. And when I interviewed the scientists that are quoted in this book, they were all excited because not only is the technology there, it's getting better. It's improving. So all I did in this book was just gather it all together. This is an update on the latest in, in all the technology because we know how to, oops, this is going the wrong way. We, well, this, this is not my right presentation. This has been all messed up. It's, got, it's in the wrong order. Uh, okay. Oh, I should have been here earlier. Anyway, we know how to capture the sun. We know how to capture the wind. We know how to capture the, the, the heat that comes out of the ground. We, uh, yeah, you started at the back, start at the very beginning, first slide, and then it'll work. Yeah, you started at the end. Not all the technology is here yet. Don't you love technology? <laughs> Don't you just love technology? Okay, let's try this one more time. Can we there? <laughs> yeah, I'm a Luddite. Anyway, we know how to do this. Okay. So we need another joke. A horse walks into a bar. The bartender says, hey, why the long face? And the horse said, I just won the Kentucky Derby, and they gave the trophy to the idiot on my back. <laughs> okay. Now what? Okay, just get rid of the side screen. Oh, that's me. No, oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> We're almost there. We're very close. Except you're giving away my whole presentation. <laughs> he works in radio, not, not electronic media, right? <laughs> so anyway, I put it all together. What I say, let me just read it, since this is supposed to be a reading, my opening line in the book, which is on the back cover. Let's start with the good news. The technology to produce energy without carbon emissions already exists. There is as much solar energy beaming down from the sky onto the earth every hour that humanity consumes in a year. 
Energy blows on the wind, boils out of the ground, and literally grows on trees. A new green age is upon us. And I really believe that. We're at the beginning of a new industrial revolution. We had all the ages before us. So we had the steam age, and we now we've had the fossil fuel age. Well, it's coming to an end, and we're going into the green age. And there's a wonderful saying. The stone age did not end because we ran out of stone. We moved on to better technology. We've done that. And we, we've done it in, in so many other ways. Like, like, think about your phone. I mean, when I was a kid, and probably when a lot of you were kids, the phone was on the wall. And you had to stand beside it. And all it did was talk. But now you carry it in your pocket. And talking is probably the last thing you do on it. Because it can do so many other things. This did not come from a government mandate. This did not come from some big revolution. It was a company that said, hey, let's develop a nice product for communication. And we all bought into it. So here, the phone has evolved. The technology evolved into something totally different. We've done it with phones. We've done it with music, for listening to music, like more than uh, about 120 years ago. The only way you could hear music was to go to a concert hall and hear it live or somebody knew how to play music. Then Thomas Edison developed the phonograph with the big horn on it so that you could play it at home. Then it turned into uh, long playing records, 45s. Then we had portable uh, record players. Then we went to tape. Then we went to cassettes. Then we went to CDs. Then we went to MP3 players. Then we went to, uh, now it's all on your phone, right? With noise canceling earbuds. Amazing technology. You can get all the, all the music in the world on your phone. But it's still just listening to music. So this is what I'm getting at. Let's, we haven't done it with energy. We haven't done it with energy. The combustion engine that's in your cars, if you still drive a car that has a, an internal combustion engine, that's 150-year-old technology. And yeah, it's a lot better than it was 150 years ago. But it's still only 20% efficient. 20% efficient. That means all the energy that's in the gasoline, only 20% of it actually turns the wheels and moves the car. 80% of the energy in the gas is thrown away as heat. You got to keep cooling a gas engine or it won't run. So it goes out the tailpipe, it goes out the radiator. 20% efficient. Now think about that next time you go for a fill up. So what's it costing now to fill up a car? Getting, getting close to 100 bucks, isn't it? Let's say it's a $100 fill up. So how would you feel going to the pump, taking the nozzle out, putting it in your car, and only putting in 20%, which would be like 20 bucks, right? Then stopping at $20, which should barely move the needle, I think, on the gauge. <laughs> then take the nozzle out, point it into the air, and point $80 worth of gas into the sky. You'd probably be arrested for wasting gas and polluting, but that's exactly what we're doing. And the only reason we can is because oil is so energy dense. And I'm going to come to this in a minute. So great. It was great in its day, but let's let it go. Let's put something else under the hood of the car. An electric motor is 80% efficient and loses very little heat. So this is what I'm talking about. Okay, let's see if these slides will work this time. We know how to capture the energy of the, of the sun, the wind, geothermal, tidal energy. We know how to store energy. We can store it in things like hydrogen. We have biofuels if you want. We have a new way of looking at nuclear energy, which I'll get to, and even crazy ideas like nuclear fusion. And I have some other ideas in the book that are so far out there, they haven't even reached us yet. So how do we do this? How do we move ahead? Well, we've had a great example of how we can change our ways and it all happened over the last couple of years when the world shut down because of COVID. Two things happened. First of all, when we stopped driving cars for a while and trucks and industry shut down, skies cleared. These are carbon emissions over China before and after the lockdown. This is the Northeastern United States, the industrial Northeast. The bottom is before, the top is after. Carbon emissions went down and cities around the world that had been polluted for decades had clear blue skies for the first time in India, in Paris, all kinds of cities around the world suddenly had blue skies. Now that's good news because that means as soon as we stop polluting the air, it heals itself almost immediately. 
Just leave it alone. It'll clean itself up. That's the first thing that happened. And the emissions drop were quite severe. Uh, and it wasn't just carbon dioxide. It was carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, which are also things that come out of fossil fuel burning. And the drop was like 35%, just instantly, just like that. So as soon as we stop, the atmosphere can start cleaning itself. The other thing that happened was how science, the government, uh, industry, and the public all got together to change the way we did things. So first of all, when the virus was identified in China, the Chinese scientists, to their credit, did the genome of it. They did the genetic sequence, its DNA, and they sent that out to the world. They said, here it is. And there was a huge international effort, including here in Canada, in biological labs all over the world, trying to identify this thing and these spikes that are on the virus and how they infect your lungs. And they found out that they get into your lungs and hijack your cells to make more virus. And then they become airborne in your lungs. So just by talking, you are expelling the virus if you're infected about a meter in front of you, just by talking. And at the same time, these viruses, they create a mucus that covers the cells in your lungs so they can't absorb oxygen. So if you have breathing problems, especially if you're a senior, you die, you suffocate. It's a terrible way to go. So they did that. Then the companies got together and said, okay, we can develop a, va a vaccine. And meanwhile, our chief medical officer, Teresa Tam and Fauci in the States, they said, okay, we've got to stay away from each other, stay two meters away and wear masks and wash your hands. And the government also supported people who lost their jobs or industries that were having trouble. Hundreds of billions of dollars suddenly became available to fight COVID around the world. And the public bought into it. We changed the way, although there were a few who didn't quite agree with that. There was a small minority of people who were putting out misinformation about vaccines, putting out misinformation about how the whole thing works and protested on the grounds of freedom. But they were a small minority of people. Ultimately, we all did buy into it. And now look, we're back in a room again. Isn't that amazing? And what did we do? We flattened the curve. Remember when they told us to flatten the curve? We did it more than once. It came up, it came back and we kept fighting it. We flattened the curve of COVID. And we did that in two years. Amazing. Okay, here's another curve we need to flatten. You've probably seen this one. These are these five ice ages I was talking about. The last half million years of the history of the earth. And you can see that the end there is still going up. Why haven't we flattened this curve? Well, let's look at the elements. The science has said, there it is. And the science has come up with the solutions, the green technology, what have the governments done? Well, we get together every now and then, gather world leaders in these conferences. The first one, and I was reporting on it, was in 1992, Rio, 92. And since then, we've had, what, Kyoto and Glasgow and Copenhagen and Paris, 26 of these meetings, 26 of them in the last 30 years. And every time they say, yep, we're gonna set goals, we're gonna set targets. They don't meet the targets. So then they get together again and say, well, we'll move the targets back a bit. We'll, we'll, we'll move the goalposts. And after 26 meetings, the emissions are still going up. That's the bottom line. Doesn't matter what the politicians say or what they do, the emissions are still going up. And this is much to the chagrin of the youth, like Greta Thunberg. The kids are scared and I don't believe them. I don't blame them, it's their future. It's their future. You know, the old farts like me, you know, we're, we're not gonna be here. To, to suffer the consequences in a hundred years, but they, they are, and they're worried about it. So how do, we, how do we make this change? There are those who disagree, who are putting out misinformation about global warming, who are putting out misinformation about carbon emissions and all of that, but they're a minority. So now we can start to move ahead. So what's the big elephant in the room? The big elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about, this mega industry called oil. Let me make it very clear. I am not pointing fingers at the oil industry and making them the enemy. Although I'm pointing at it right now, aren't I? Yeah. I'm not gonna point at governments and say it's their fault. As soon as you start pointing fingers at anyone and make them the bad guys, like you got the, the evil oil empire and the, the really good tree huggers in British Columbia, yeah, no, no, don't do that. Because when you do, it becomes polarized and both sides just dig in their heels and nothing happens. 
That's not the way to do it. Don't make it confrontation. So first of all, oil is amazing. Oil is so convenient. No wonder it drove the, the Industrial Revolution because it has so much energy in such a small space. And you don't need to use it all at once. You can store it, use it whenever you want. And it's great. Now, how much energy does it hold? Well, there's a unit called the joule. So one standard 45 gallon drum of oil contains 6.3 billion joules of energy. A joule is a unit of work. How much work can it do? Now, to give you context, let me show you one joule. Okay. Um, I think this book weighs about one kilo. So you take one kilo, hold it out like this, and do that. One kilo raised one meter is one joule. So how much energy is in a barrel of oil? Do this six billion times, and you've got the amount of energy in one barrel of oil. That's a lot. Now, even that's hard to get your head around. So here's another unit of measurement besides the jewel, the Great Pyramids of Egypt. Somebody actually calculated how much, how many jewels it took to build the, uh, the pyramids, just purely mathematically. They calculated the mass of all the stones and how high they had to be raised. And they came up with a number. And the number is 2.4 trillion jewels. How many barrels of oil would build the pyramids? It turns out 400. That's it, 400 barrels. You can get that out of one well in one day. One oil well can pump that in one day and build the pyramids. There's 400 barrels right there. That's amazing. So when you add up all the energy that we use every year worldwide, we burn 2 million pyramids a year. 2 million pyramids. It took the ancient Egyptians 20 years just to build them once. We're awash in energy. We are awash in energy. We just use so much of it. We take it for granted because it's always there. We don't even know how much we're using. And again, a lot of our technology that burns fossil fuels is only 20 or 30% efficient. So we're throwing a lot of it away. So let's just rethink this. But we're not going to throw away oil. It's too valuable. It's too valuable. Here's the problem with the way we're burning oil now. Uh, oh, and it's not just oil you get. You get uh, all these other things. You get asphalt, you get jet fuel, you get gasoline, uh, but plastic. Some of the fibers that you're wearing in your clothes right now are oil products. So there's a lot of stuff we get out of it. We're not going to throw it away. However, the difficulty with oil, we call it a hydrocarbon. That's because it's a bunch of carbon atoms all in a chain with hydrogen atoms stuck to it. I like to think of it like a, um, uh, a chain of Christmas lights. What you're interested in the Christmas lights when you turn on, it's only the bulbs that light up, right? So when you burn a hydrocarbon, just straight light a match, it's the hydrogen that's coming off. The carbon stays behind. And that carbon, once it loses its hydrogen, it wants to bond with something else. So it'll take, oh, oxygen, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, or if there's sulfur in there, sulfur dioxide. So it's the leftovers, those are the problems. Okay, here's another idea to get energy out of oil without the emissions, just take the hydrogen. And the oil companies are looking at this, just producing hydrogen. And we've got hydrogen vehicles already. Toyota makes one called Amira. It's a fuel cell car. And there are prototype hydrogen filling stations. I live on the West Coast now in Victoria. We have one there. And there's several in Vancouver. And there are a number in, on the West Coast in California. And you can fill up hydrogen like a regular car. It only takes a few minutes, unlike the hours it takes for a battery or half hour. So watch out for hydrogen. There was a lot of research done in the past, but it's going to come back. This is a way the oil companies can stay in business if they think of themselves as energy companies instead of oil companies. Just give us a different product. And I challenge any of the young engineers that are here in the I don't see too many. But anyway, come up with another way to get energy out of oil. Besides just the hydrogen, there, there must be other ways to do that. That's an engineering challenge. So we can just change the way we get that energy up because it contains so much. Um, there's a company in Saskatchewan that uh, is getting hydrogen out of oil while it's still in the ground. They have a technology where they use abandoned oil wells. They have two of them. One, they put down steam and, and hot water, or steam and oxygen. It reacts with the oil and then hydrogen comes out the other well. Get the hydrogen out, the oil stays in the ground. Great idea. So watch out for that. Now, 
in Iceland, which is a volcanic island, they get a lot of their electricity from geothermal. Geothermal in Canada is a little tricky because uh, you need to have heat close to the surface and volcanoes do that, the, the magma is right there. In Canada, we've got mostly the Canadian shield here and it's very thick, dense rock. It's hard to drill through and you got to go down really, really deep before you get uh, to the heat, so it's expensive. Most of the geothermal energy in Canada is in the West where we have mountains and volcanoes, but most of the industry is in the East. So it's, it's hard to transport energy over long distance, but nonetheless, it's there. And so what Iceland is doing is they're taking their cheap electricity, clean, cheap electricity from geothermal and using it to break down water to make hydrogen. And uh, that's electrolysis. So they're gonna, they're gonna go to a hydrogen economy because they don't have any oil of their own. They have to import everything, so it's really expensive. What a smart idea, what a smart idea. And who's helping them? You know who's helping them out with the hydrogen distribution? Shell oil. Royal Dutch Shell is helping a company get off oil. <laughs> and they've got the right attitude. They say, we don't care if people filling up at a station are using hydrogen, as long as the filling station says Shell. <laughs> Brilliant, I love it. What a great model, what a great model. Now. <clears throat> Airbus, Airbus Industries is coming up with some hydrogen powered aircraft. They have a commuter plane, similar to what we fly here in Canada. They're coming up with a small jet that's gonna run on hydrogen and electricity, they're hybrid engines, and they have a very futuristic looking called a blended wing. Now, the one thing about these, because the aviation industry realizes they pollute a lot and it's hard to replace jet fuel. So <laughs> the thing about this, hydrogen gives you a lot of energy, but it takes up more space. So you need larger tanks. And normally the fuel in an airplane is in the wings. But on these planes, some of it's gonna be in the wings, but there's also going to be a big tank in the fuselage where you're sitting. So how would you feel getting on an airplane knowing there's a big tank of hydrogen behind you? I know what you're thinking. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the Hindenburg. First of all, it's too bad that it was caught on film because there were other airships that crashed and nobody got on film. 92 people survived the Hindenburg crash. That's more than half of them. And the reason they survived is because the hydrogen fire that was holding the airship up in the big envelope, it went up. Hydrogen is lighter than air. It rises. And the hydrogen fire was over in 45 seconds. That's how long it took. And as the structure came down to the ground, people just jumped out windows and they ran out from under the fire. The fire was all over their heads. The people who died were caught in the collapsing structure. And get this, the diesel fuel from the engines, which pooled on the ground and burned. Diesel fuel stays down. Gasoline stays on the ground. That's why the fire department shows up at major car crashes, because if there's a leak, the fuel gets underneath the car and it cooks it like a barbecue. You get a hydrogen leak, it goes up, it's gone. So hydrogen is actually safer than gasoline. I know you don't believe that, but it is, it is. So these are the things we gotta talk about. Okay, let me just uh, get on to a couple of other things here. Um, electric cars, you're probably noticing there are more electric cars on the road now than there were before, and they're not all Teslas. Tesla set the bar, and they're very expensive cars because it's a smaller company, but all the major companies are now coming up with them. And I thought it was very brave of Ford to take their iconic gas guzzling muscle car, the Mustang, and make it electric. How neat. That's a, that's a very brave thing. And so electric cars are going to come down in costs. They're going to come way down in costs. The biggest obstacle to electric cars is the batteries. And right now the batteries are made of lithium ion and there are issues with mining lithium. I was at a lithium mine in the Atacama Desert of Chile, which is the driest place on earth. And in order to mine lithium, they have to use enormous amounts of water in the driest place on earth. So the local communities are not very happy about that. So we've got issues with mining lithium, uh, mining cobalt, which comes from the Congo in Africa, which has child labor issues. So we gotta, we gotta deal with that. Well, there's a whole lot of research going into battery technology right now. These are solid state batteries. They're very flat and they don't have any liquids in them, so they can't catch fire. And they're looking at new materials for batteries, polymers. <laughs> There's even a battery made of iron. It's made of iron and all it does is rust and you get electricity out of it. What a great idea. Mm -hmm. 
So there's a huge amount of research. So watch out for that. The battery technology is going to uh, is going to change. Now we know how to catch the sun. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time, and you're probably familiar with the uh, the dark solar panels that you can put on your roof. And by the way, if you're thinking about it, do a little research. Just research it. Find out. It may not be for you, but find out. The cost of these is coming down dramatically, and it's not just the the initial cost. But when do you get that payback? over the long term, how long does it take? It's usually less than 10 years before you get the, the payback because fuel costs are going up, especially if your house is heated by fossil fuels. So they're gonna continue to rise. We know how to do this. We also do it in big fields. Some people criticize, oh, those fields could be used for agriculture, yeah. Um, but there's um, another kind of solar material. This, is, this, this really excited me when I found out about this. They're called perovskites. And it's a class of materials that you can print into really thin films, so thin you can actually see through them. And it doesn't make sense. Something that's supposed to capture sunlight allows light to go right through it. But they can be tuned to capture light that we don't see, like ultraviolet light. So you can use them on windows. You can use them to coat windows. And if you think about all of the glass windows that we have in our major cities on these tall condos and office towers that are facing south, that's an enormous area. So those windows could become solar and they could start to reduce the, the, the consumption of the building itself. Great idea. Another idea that they're working on is solar paint. Solar paint with perovskites in it. So just paint your house, <laughs> it becomes solar, how neat. Or an even better idea, suppose the walls inside your house are coated in, in perovskite paint. When you turn on the lights, sure the lights light up the room, but some of that light goes into the walls and it's going to be absorbed and turned back into electricity. Recycling light. Recycling, what a great idea, I love that, recycling light. So this is the thing. Solar energy is going to be everywhere and you won't even see it. It'll be incorporated into the architecture of buildings. They're even talking about solar fabric, solar fabric. Imagine if they get to the point where the clothes that you're wearing are solar so you can charge your phone just by sticking it in your pocket. <laughs> your jacket charges your phone <laughs> or your tent fly. You know, have solar tent flies so you can have your phone or your computer when you're camping, which I think is a dumb idea. But anyway, it's, it's, it, could, it could be done. Could be done. So solar, is, the solar research is really exciting to me. Um, and in terms of area, uh, India is going really big on solar because they get so much sunlight there. They're, they're putting solar panels over canals because a lot of India is irrigated and they have thousands and thousands of kilometers of canals. And the advantage here is that the panels provide shading for the water to prevent evaporation. California is also looking at this and it prevents algal growth and the solar panels actually are cooled a bit and they work better when they're a little cooled. So it's a win-win-win situation uh, when we're looking for places to put solar panels. Wind, we've been capturing the wind for centuries. I've also put some uh, personal stories in here to make it a little more interesting to read. It's not all technology. I'm a sailor and I've been punched by storms a couple of times. And boy, I'll tell you, it's pretty humbling to feel the power of the wind. I got caught one time, uh, my first time sailing in Florida and I got caught by a, a squall, a thunder squall, not the hurricane that just went through there, but it was a squall. And they come on really fast and really hard and I had all the sails up. And it was just like this invisible hand came along and just pushed my sails into the sea. And the whole boat just came right over on her side. And oh my God, what have I done? And, and then the rain came and somebody poured a bucket of water over my head. It was just crazy. For 20 minutes, I was struggling for survival on the wind. You can have too much wind sometimes. But we've been, we've been capturing the wind for so many centuries. We've crossed oceans with it. Holland built itself on wind power. These ubiquitous farm windmills, which were very popular in this part of the world for a long time before electricity came to rural areas, pumping water, and there were small turbines that could generate electricity at night to keep the lights on. Now, the most common form is this three-bladed propeller. It's, it's the most efficient design, and uh, you might have seen fields of them, and people say, oh, they're, they're ugly. You need so many of them. That's one of the problems with the clean energy. There's lots of it. It's everywhere, but it's spread out. It's not like oil that's all nice and dense. It's spread out all over the place. So you need large technology to gather. Well, in wind technology, size matters. And they've gone big. 
very big. The largest in the world now are 12 to 15 megawatts of power out of one. That's enough for 16,000 homes. Just a single turn of the blade will give you enough electricity to power a house for two days. So instead of having a whole field of smaller ones, you just need a few large ones. And this is uh, how big they are. It's hard, it's hard to get a sense, but the, this is our Peace Tower in Ottawa on the, the Parliament buildings. So the largest windmill is two and a half times higher than the Peace Tower. They're gigantic. And rather than put them on land, the idea is to put them out at sea where the winds are stronger anyway and more consistent. And they're out of sight so people don't call them ugly. They can either be on platforms or they can be even floating. So the US is uh, planning to do this in the Atlantic. Europe is already doing it uh, on the other side of the Atlantic. Canada could be doing more of this, but we're not. So this is the future. Wind is huge and uh, they're, they're really, really big. You can do the same thing with tides, which is something Canada can do, not so much here in Manitoba, but certainly in Nova Scotia and in British Columbia, because, well, Nova Scotia is the highest tides in the world. And when you, on the West Coast, we have islands where I love to sail now, I, I have my boat there. And when you go between islands, uh, the tide will speed up and, and it flows like a river. In fact, <laughs> when I first moved to uh, Vancouver Island, I was out, had all the sails up, sailing along, thinking I was having a really great day. Then I looked at the shore and I was going backwards. <laughs> the tide was stronger than the wind. I was going backwards. So, well, I guess we're going that way. We're not going that way. So you put these windmills under underground. They're not windmills, they're uh, turbines. And they're smaller because water is so dense. Um, Scotland is big into this because they have the Orkney Islands at the top of Scotland. So they did a lot of research with this. Another way that they're looking at in Nova Scotia uh, and in Scotland are floating turbines so that you have what looks like a boat with giant propellers on the back. The boat is anchored in the tidal current. Then you just drop the propellers down, the tide spins them and they generate electricity. The advantage of this is that if you need to work on them, if they get all crudded up with scum and particles or whatever, you can just lift them out of the water and work on them. The ones that are sitting on the bottom are harder to work on. And here's one in Scotland that looks like something Batman would drive. It's, uh, same idea, just these two giant propellers, you just drop them down. So tidal energy, there's, and we know when the tides are gonna be flowing up to the minute for the next 500 years, we know exactly when they flow. And I have a story in here about how I experienced the tides taking my sailboat through the famous reversing falls of St. John, New Brunswick, which is this torrent of water that I got caught in. So I felt the tides as well. Um, battery storage, there's a big, there's a big, criticism of alternative energy that the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. So we have to store the energy somehow when the wind isn't blowing. Batteries can do it. And Tesla will build you these gigantic battery packs that can power, well, they could power Winnipeg for about two hours, two hours. That's about what you get out of them. And they're fairly expensive, but there are other ways to store energy. It doesn't have to be in a battery. Um, hydrogen. You can store it in hydrogen. Have your windmill make hydrogen and then use that when you need it because it, it's storable. Or there's a company in Ontario that's using air, using air. They have an abandoned mine that they sealed up and all they do is they pump air in. When the, when the electricity is there, they pump air down this mine and they compress it. So it goes really up to high pressure like a balloon when you blow a balloon up. Then they just hold on to it and when you need energy, when there's a blackout or you need supplies, you let the air out through a narrow opening and it's like the balloon, but it spins a turbine and generates electricity. Clean air storage, no carbon emissions. Um, are you familiar with the myth of Sisyphus? Sisyphus, he, was, uh, he insulted the gods. He insulted the gods, which you don't do. And they punished him with the task of rolling a rock up a hill every day at tremendous effort. And when the rock got to the top, it instantly rolled back down and he had to start all over again the next day for the rest of his life or eternity. Well, Sisyphus probably didn't realize it, but he was the world's first mechanical battery. Mechanical battery. Because by pushing that rock up the hill, he was giving it potential energy the potential to fall. And as long as the rock stayed on top of the hill, which he would have really liked, as long as it stays there, it's storing that energy. 
And then when it rolls down, it releases that energy. And if you were to get hit by that rock when it was coming down, well, that would be a lot, a lot of force being released there. So you can store things mechanically. And there's a group in Europe, they're building a device that uses gravity to store energy. It's a big pile of huge concrete blocks. And there are these five cranes at the top that when you need the energy back, you pick up a block, hold it out to the side and let it fall to the ground. And as it's going down, there's a pulley at the top of the crane that's spinning a turbine. So the gravity is providing it with electricity. Again, clean, free. And you can make these as big as you want, depending on how much energy you want to store. And finally, there's a group in Norway that are storing energy in sand, in sand. You ever been to a tropical beach? You go out in the sunshine, you forget to put on your flip-flops, your bare feet. Sand can be heated up to a thousand degrees and it will not melt. It will not melt. So they've got these big containers. Here's what they look like in infrared. They're storing energy in sand, in heat energy. And they've gone beyond these containers. They dig big pits and they put pipes through them to get the heat in and out and they fill them with sand. They heat them up to a thousand degrees. They get seasonal heat, seasonal heat because Norway gets dark winters like we do. So they're heating their homes in a town for, from sand for months, for months. That's astounding, just from, from the sand itself. So again, energy storage comes in many, many different forms. Um, I'll just briefly talk about a trigger word in many people's minds, and this is nuclear. There is a new approach to nuclear. They're called small modular nuclear reactors, and the Canadian government is looking into this right now. These are not like the ones we've had in the past. They're not the big mega plants that we had before that took billions of dollars to build, years to construct, millions to maintain every year. These things are small. The reactor core itself isn't much bigger than an office desk. And it comes completely sealed up in a container that you don't touch. It arrives on a truck or a rail car, and you could take it up to say a northern community, some of the smaller communities we have up north that are now running on diesel generators, and you put these things underground. You don't touch them. You put them underground, you just get the energy out of them for about 30 years, and then when they wear out, you take them out, send them back to the factory, and you plug in a new one. Now, these type of small reactors have been in aircraft carriers, nuclear submarines, and Russian air icebreakers for decades without incident. And you think about an aircraft carrier, you know, these big nuclear aircraft, they've got like about three or 4,000 people in there with a nuclear reactor right in the middle. And they're fine, they're fine. Now I know there are waste products that are involved in nuclear energy, but in Canada, all of our nuclear waste that we've produced in our whole history, which is over 50 years old now, would fit into seven hockey rinks up to the boards. That's it. And we know where every gram of it is. It's all contained. It's all under lock and key. Compare that to the billions of tons of carbon that we throw into the air every year. You know that, that a car with a combustion engine produces its own weight in carbon every year? Produces its own weight in carbon every year. And we're just letting that happen. Oh yeah, that's okay. So yeah, we got to deal with the nuclear waste. Some of these reactors can actually burn that. They're called breeder reactors. They can burn used nuclear waste, so we can reduce the amount. There's another kind called a molten salt. The fuel is already liquid. It can't melt. It can't melt. So these things are, are completely uh, safe. So what we need is conversation about this. We need good, frank, open conversation between the nuclear industry and the public to explain how these things work. And we think because of the advantage of nuclear, no emissions, and it's 24-7 power. It's there all the time, it's a baseline. So we have to rethink and, and really talk seriously about nuclear again. Again, I'm not promoting anything here, okay? Don't call me a nuclear promoter. I'm just saying, here it is, here it is. Um, then finally, there's the crazy idea of fusion power. Um, fusion is the opposite of fission. The, the nuclear stuff we're doing now, you take a big atom of uranium and you split it apart, splitting the atom, and it gives off energy. Fusion, you're trying to take atoms and you're fusing them together into something else. And what you fuse them into is less than what you started with, so energy comes out. The problem is atoms don't like to do that. They don't like to fuse because they're held together by very strong forces. 
Like, I can't, I can't put my fist through this table because the forces that are holding the atoms of my fist together are opposing the forces that are holding the table together. Even though atoms are 99.9% .9 empty space, I can't, I can't do that. So these forms, they don't want to. So in other words, you've got to really hit them hard if you want them to force. And in order to do that, you have to make them very hot. And this has been just the tiniest little stumbling block the fusion industry has had. There's a joke. Fusion has been 20 years away for 50 years. The reason, one of the reasons, you have to heat this purple plasma up to 150 million degrees, which is 10 times hotter than the, the, the center of the sun. So what do you put that in? What kind of container will hold something that's 150 million degrees? So the way they have to do it is they got to create this magnetic donut and suspend the, the plasma in the middle of the donut without touching the walls so it won't melt. And it takes tremendous amount of energy to do that. More energy than they're getting out. That's the problem. They're putting more in than they're getting out. However, there is a plant in France right now that's being built. It should be ready in the next, well, less than 20 years. <laughs> next couple of years, it'll go online. And they're expecting to get 10 times as much out as they put in. And once they do that, it'll be self-sufficient. It'll run itself. No emissions, no, none of those nasty radioactive products. So fusion, well, let's see what happens. And then finally, I have a chapter in the book called Nice idea, but, and these are ideas that are way out there, but haven't quite made it yet or not gonna make it at all. And one of them is space-based solar power. So you have a giant satellite in space with big mirrors on it, gather sunlight, turn it into a microwave beam or a laser beam and beam it to the ground. And then on the ground is a big receiving station that absorbs that and turns it into electricity. Theoretically, one of those satellites could run all of Winnipeg. The whole town. Um, problem is, I don't know how comfortable people would feel having a giant laser beam coming down from space. No fly zone, for sure. I don't know how the migratory birds would feel about that. Uh, you cook your bird while you're flying south. It could also be sabotaged pretty easily, too. So I, I don't know, but it's a crazy idea. At least technically, it could be done. And uh, there are a lot of other uh, goofy ideas. I'm going to skip through the next section because I, I want to hear what, what your questions are. So we can change our cities and our houses and you know more urban transit and all this. But let me leave you with a with a thought. I meet some really interesting people in my my work. Uh, I like to say that I talk to smart people for a living. You know, just uh, two days ago, I talked to the guy who won the Nobel Prize. He was talking to me. How neat. I get to talk to the person who just won the Nobel Prize. And it's, um, it's a real privilege to work on Quirks and Quarks. And every week, scientists from around the world tell me their stories. And it's all new. It's all stuff we didn't know before. And I feel very fortunate to do that. I, I feel sorry for some of my colleagues at the CBC who are the uh, political reporters. But, um, <laughs> I hope there aren't any politicians in the room. <laughs> anyway, no, no. Um, I, I feel very fortunate. So one of the people that I met when I was living in Toronto is the guy in the white t-shirt, not the guy having a bad hair day in the middle. But I was at a banquet, uh, he was sitting beside me and I said, hey, would you like to go sailing tomorrow? I have a sailboat in the harbor, you wanna go sailing? And he said, sure. And I went, yes, yes, yes. Because when I was a kid in 1969, Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon. He and Neil Armstrong were the first to land on the moon. I took Buzz Aldrin sailing, hey, how cool is that? Huh? Yeah, Buzz said an interesting thing. He said, you know, the moon is a really interesting place, but it's not a very nice place. And he's right. He is one of only 24 human beings that got to see the earth as a complete sphere. They don't see that today on the International Space Station because it's only 400 kilometers up, which isn't very high. Um, what's 400 kilometers from here? Regina? Uh, that's 600. Yeah, so it's closer than here to Virginia. Uh, so they can see the curve of the Earth, but they don't see the whole thing. So it was only those who went to the moon that got to see the entire Earth. And, and this picture, this iconic Earthrise picture, I also met the guy, the first one to take this. And um, he was on the very first mission to the moon called Apollo 8, Bill Anders. They didn't land. They just went there and went around a few times and came back. And I said, what was it like to take that, that shot? And he said... We weren't intending to take that. 
that was not in our itinerary. He said, our job was to photograph the moon. We were to photograph the landing sites so they'd have good photographs when they landed. He said, it wasn't until our third time around the moon, the command module happened to be pointed forward and the earth rose and all three of us just put our noses to the glass and went, holy shit, cow. <laughs> Look at that. And then, you know, Jim Lovell, the commander said, did you get the picture? Uh, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I hadn't even thought about it. And yet this has become sort of the iconic picture of the environmental movement. But look at the look at the foreground in the bottom there, the moon. It's dry. There's no air. The sky is black. You, you go for a walk on the moon, you'll die in about 15 seconds because you'll be cooked by cosmic radiation. You'll suffocate. There's no air to breathe. And this beautiful blue earth surrounded by black, a very black, violent universe. You know, there are up to 5,000 planets now that we've found going around other stars, 5,000. But we have yet to find one of these. They're all really interesting, like the moon, but they'll all kill you. Every planet we know of will kill you. It's not like Star Trek. I love Star Trek. But the one thing that bugs me <laughs> is every time they beam down to a planet, it's always a really nice day. <laughs> The sun's out, it's warm. They're not even wearing coats for God's sake. It's not like that. The universe is a violent, deadly place. And if we do find another Earth, and I'm sure we will, it's going to be very, very, very far away from here. We can't get to it. So, in other words, this is it. Here we are down here, just burning away everything in sight. Uh, where Our fires are visible from space. This is called the black marble. Uh, that was called the blue marble. This is the black marble. There we are. Um, you are that one, I think. I think that's Winnipeg. But our fires are visible from space. Our fires are visible from space. So we can dim those lights because this is it. This is it. This is all we have. We live in the Garden of Eden. And it's just amazing that we're even here. So I do believe, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic. We went to the moon. We did amazing things. We developed cell phones. We beat COVID in only two years, but we can do it again with climate. And I want to leave you with one last little statistic, a little motivation for why we should do this. It's not just about the climate. According to three different studies, between seven and eight million people a year die from the effects of fossil fuels and climate change, mostly from air pollution. Six to uh, seven to eight million people a year die from fossil fuel burning. During COVID, the two years of COVID, five and a half million people died. And we got all upset about that. More people died from fossil fuels than from COVID. So let's think about that. Not get depressed about it. Don't get down about it. Don't get depressed. Don't point at bad guys. Let's move ahead. Let's just move ahead and let it evolve our technology like we evolved other technology and move forward into a future because the future is now, it's here now. I hope you enjoy the book and thank you so much for having me here tonight. Thank you so much, Bob. Uh, just as we uh, move along to the Q&A, we'll start with a question from somebody online who uh, mentions what a delight it is to have you back in Winnipeg. <laughs> he loved how you ended the book, spoiler alert, with your voting analogy. And in reference to another thing you mentioned, how do we convince our politicians to heed your advice and think upstream? Vote smart. Um, vote, in, vote with uh, knowledge and intelligence. Well, for people who have a vision of the future, a clean vision of the future. But it's not all about the politicians. It's not. That's my point. It's all of us. The, the phone didn't come out of, out of governments. It didn't come out of government action. It came out of the private sector. Clean energy is one of the fastest growing sectors of the economy. So it's a good investment. It provides jobs. And if you adopt green technology, you're saving money because you're, the fuel costs keep going up. So it's all of us, it's, it's the governments, it's industry, it's science, and it's the public. And we all work together and make it happen. So I, I don't wanna just blame the politicians, but it does help if you can elect people who have a vision of, of a clean future. Perfect. 
And we have a question over here. Not to be too much of a downer, but um, can you comment on the what the next generation of Canadian scientists are, are facing, especially graduate students coming out of university? Yeah, we just did a night about quirks about how uh, uh, university students in Canada are li living basically at the poverty level. And uh, a lot of the grants that scientists get here do come from the government. So they're lobbying to raise the, uh, the levels of the governments because they, they haven't been raised, I think, since 2008 or something like that. So we publicize that. And there is an organization that is lobbying the government to support our science. And I hope they do. I hope they do. We also have industrial science as well, applied science. We have a lot of great intellectual capital in Canada. We're amazing. You know. Um, People don't realize it, but uh, I, I spoke at a, a conference in the US, a space conference. And I said, hello, I'm from a little country just north of here. <laughs> and they were all space geeks. And I said, and by the way, we were the third country in space. And they're all going, oh, well, can be right. I said, yeah. I said, Russia was first with Sputnik in 1957. You were second with Explorer One in 1958. Canada was third with our satellite called Alouette One, which went up in 1962. And the whole room, they're all looking it up on their phones. And they're like, I said, yeah. And by the way, Sputnik and Explorer One have since fallen out of their orbits and burned up in the atmosphere. Alouette's still up there. When we put something up, it stays up. We do it right. And that's true. Alouette's still up there. So we do wonderful things, you know, we, we build high technology and, and we have great intellectual capital. So I hope our, you know, we'll continue to support it. So let's hope the government does that. Yeah. Hi, hi, Bob, you're, you're pretty good at uh, making very complex stuff pretty simple. On your first slide, you showed the curve of uh, carbon emissions since uh, before the industrial revolution. So they're roughly uh, 420 parts per million. Yep. It doesn't sound like a big number. So could you explain why carbon dioxide molecules at 420 parts per million are such a big deal? Yes, um, and that's a question that comes up a lot because carbon dioxide is a very small percentage of our atmosphere. Most of the air you're breathing right now is nitrogen. That's 80% of it. 20% is oxygen, well, less than that. And then all these other small trace elements. The thing about carbon dioxide is that it doesn't, like sunlight can pass right through it in the atmosphere. Our atmosphere is heated from the bottom up. The sun heats the ground. The ground then gets hot and heats the air from the bottom up. And the heat that's coming off the ground, that heat is infrared radiation. It turns out that infrared radiation will be absorbed by carbon dioxide. So it starts to take in that energy, it gets energetic, then it gives it back. And when it gives it back, it gives it into the air itself. So it's an accelerator. So it's, it's not exactly like a greenhouse. It's not reflecting back, it's absorbing and letting it out. Water vapor does the same thing, methane does it even more. So even though they're small, small percentages, they have this large effect that's accumulated, that accumulates over time. Now you might be saying, I know volcanoes give off a lot of carbon dioxide and uh, the earth itself gives off carbon dioxide. And you're exactly right. That could used to do it a lot more than it does now. But that's background. That's always been there, those, those natural sources of carbon. We're putting our foot on the accelerator. We're putting our foot on the accelerator. And that's what the issue is, is it's not so much how warm the earth is, it's how quickly it's changing. Because when the dinosaurs were here, the earth was actually warmer than it is now. So the earth has been warmer than this in the past, but it's the rate of change. That's the concern of the scientists and the environment can't, can't adapt quickly enough. So, you know, the, the permafrost up north is melting really, really quickly right now because the, the climate is moving up there. That's, that's the issue. So it is, it is a small trace gas, but it has a large impact because of that, that resonance with infrared radiation. It's part of it. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you. The city of Winnipeg is very aware that we are losing our tree canopy. Yes. Would you have any suggestions for us as a city to really help restore this uh, to help with climate? Plant more trees. <laughs> <laughs> I 
this, let me show you, this uh, trees work. Uh, oh, we, we turn it off. One of the slides that went by very quickly there when I was flashing that purple thing had, was Vancouver from the air. And all the white dots were roofs of houses and all the purple dots were trees. Trees do a lot. They provide shade, which cools, but they also give off moisture, which also cools the air. And um, there's, I have a chapter here on how cities can change by planting more trees and going from wide boulevards in the downtown cores that are made for cars and shrinking it down to narrower boulevards to restrict the cars and cars drive slower in, in narrower lanes and put more patios. I, I don't know if they did it here, but during COVID, a lot of restaurants were allowed to put patios out on the sidewalks, right? Well, keep that, keep that. Make the sidewalks wider, plant trees, make boulevards and have bike lanes. And if you don't want to ride a bicycle, get an e-bike. Those things go like crazy, <laughs> they're so powerful. Um, so there's no excuse not to ride a bicycle anymore. So we change the nature of how we get around in the cities and planting trees is all part of that. So the more trees, the better. I, I was also noticing here, just as Ariel and I were driving here that you have elm trees here. I haven't seen elm trees in, since I was a kid. That's astounding. They're disappearing. But they're disappearing, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. So um, re-greening the earth not just in our cities, but everywhere, and preserve green land. That's, that's a big thing. It's, there's a term called rewilding, rewilding the earth, preserve what we have and try to expand. And there are some organizations that do that. Uh, out west where I live, there's a thing called the Nature Conservancy, and they actually buy land yeah. and just leave it. <laughs> just buy land and keep the developers away. So um, yeah, trees, trees are an important part of that. Or that quieted the room down. <laughs> So I've heard you uh, talk about a great number of different uh, sources of energy. And one of them that you talked about was nuclear. Mm -hmm. But there are a plethora of other options available to us, solar, uh, wind. And one of the concerns I have about nuclear is in a successful state, I'm not worried about nuclear. But where you have a failed state, uh, or whether you have a conflict of the kind we're seeing between uh, Russia and the Ukraine, uh, you have nuclear reactors there that suddenly are in the center of a conflict and the nuclear mm -hmm. material can become uh, stolen, uh, nuclear material can become uh, spread across the landscape. And so my, my hesitation to adopt nuclear isn't because we can't build a safe reactor, it's because we can't build safe states and safe societies that will be sustainable into the future. And we can't do the same thing with uh, hydroelectric dams either. They could be bombed. And when a dam is bombed, uh, cities are flooded and millions of people can die if, if, a, if a dam is bombed. Every form of energy has a cost. It doesn't matter whether you're talking nuclear or hydro or solar, or whatever, there's a cost to it. And we have to talk about those costs versus the risks versus the gains. And uh, so, yeah, the, the thing with, with nuclear, when things go bad, they seem to go very, very bad. But let me put some perspective on the accidents that we've had so far. There was Chernobyl, there was Three Mile Island, you remember that one? And Fukushima. Chernobyl was horrible. It was an old style reactor that used graphite within the reactor itself as a moderator. Graphite burns. And it was human error. They let water out. They were doing a test. They wanted to see how, how, how well can this thing run if the water levels go down? And the water levels were already down, they let too much out, it overheated, and the graphite ignited, and the water turned to steam, and it was a steam explosion. It was not a nuclear explosion, it was a steam explosion, but it blew the entire reactor and the building apart, threw it up into the sky, and yeah, there was radioactive material that was spread all over Europe and around the world. That was bad. We don't make reactors like that anymore. Three Mile Island, nobody died in Three Mile Island. And there's no evidence of increased cancer rates after the Three Mile Island accident. The reactor did exactly what it was supposed to do. It contained the fuel. It melted. Yep, it was, it was another human error. Water ran out. The fuel melted. It went down, but it was contained within the building. And they ultimately cleaned that up. And they, and they, they disposed of that. So they got it. And there's no epidemiological evidence to show that cancer rates went up around Three Mile Island. The problem was... Three days before that accident happened, a movie came out called The China Syndrome. And it was about exactly that, a nuclear meltdown. And in the movie, they said, if that stuff gets out, it's gonna go through the reactor floor, it's gonna go all the way to the earth to China. It's terrible. And they set up this huge fear factor and it was a great dish, but the Three Mile Island itself wasn't like that. Fukushima, three reactors melted down. 
the core material is still there. The reactors did what they were supposed to do. And they show pictures of the Fukushima plant and these explosions happening. That's not the reactors. Because water is involved, when you superheat it, it breaks into hydrogen and oxygen, H2O, right? The hydrogen had accumulated in the roof of the building. That's what burned, that's what exploded, was the hydrogen, not the new. So Fukushima is still contained, it's still contained. So there's a huge fear factor here. Yes, the waste material is nasty stuff, lasting thousands of years. But like I say, we know where it all is, and we now have technology to reburn some of that used stuff. So could it be a target? Sure. So could a beam from space. So could a hydroelectric dam. So could anything. When it comes to human conflict, I have a I have a suggestion. I have two suggestions. I have two suggestions for the countries that have nuclear missiles pointed at each other. You know they have to push buttons to launch those missiles. Switch the buttons. Switch the buttons. So if you hit the button, you fire their missiles towards you. You've never hit it, right? The other suggestion I have, we have all these days throughout the year, you know, uh, uh, like, like a senior's day or, or you know, child day or all this. How about nobody gets shot day? How about nobody gets shot day? How about one of those? How, we, it bothers me that our highest science and technology, and this has been throughout history, our highest state of science and technology has been devoted to developing creative ways to kill each other. I would sure like to get over that. I don't know if we ever will, but um, I, I don't talk about human conflict in here. So uh, uh, don't get me started. Sorry, I'm rambling on I here. think you opened up a Pandora's box. Yeah, yeah okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to, to lecture you there, but- uh, I don't know, it's interesting. Yeah. Anyway, over here. Thank you very much. Oh, absolutely. And then we'll take one more question after this. Okay. Uh, Bob, in your opinion, how long will it be before fusion becomes our main source of energy? How long before fusion becomes our main source of energy? They're saying uh, that it should come online uh, within the next five years, and it should be operational within the well, probably seven to eight years in France, the first one. Now, there's another style of reactor. The one in France is, is gigantic and very expensive. It's a multinational project that's cost many billions of dollars, and it's over budget and it's behind time. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, has developed a new design that's much smaller using more modern electromagnets that they say will have, they'll have out in less than 10 years. And they'll be small. They'll be like the modular nuclear reactors. They'll just power small towns and regions. So I, I believe before the decade, yeah, before the end of this decade, we'll see fusion. What, how, how well it will be spread out, I don't know, but at least we'll have operating, we will have cr crossed that crucial point of more out than you put in. So I might see it. But MIT <laughs> seems to be, yeah. MIT, yeah, they may have the answer. There's also a company in Vancouver that's working on fusion, and they have a completely different approach to it. Uh, again, I described it in the book. They're using pressure. If, you know, if you just squeeze something, it heats up. So they've got these enormous hydraulic jacks or some kind of jacks and they have a, a fuel that's in the middle and they squeeze it from all directions at once and they can get that 150 million degrees. And they're now in England being uh, being built. So there's another approach to fusion as well. So yeah, it's coming, it's coming along with hydrogen. One more, there was a question here. Yeah. Well, we'll do two more. Uh, so we'll do you as well and this gentleman. Okay. Plus, if you want to meet me later, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk. So about 45 years ago, the world came together to solve the hole in the ozone. Yes. And there was a lot of discussion, a lot of it doesn't exist and all that kind of stuff. And finally, it came to pass. I mean, Senator said you can wear sunscreen. Mm -hmm. And there were cartoons showing cows with sunscreen. So the world finally came together to solve what? Why the delay on the issues we face now, do you think? Yes. So what do we need to do to kind of move them along? The ozone crisis was an interesting situation because, again, scientists identified something that you can't even see. That's a gas in our atmosphere. and There's a hole and that lets ultraviolet light from the sun through. And we can't let that happen. And there was a clear culprit. And there were chlorofluorocarbon CFCs that were used in spray cans and air conditioners. The technology to replace CFCs was easy. They just changed the chemistry. They just found another liquid. And then it was easy to say, OK, we're going to ban the CFCs. We're going to demand that that. So the government's got together in Montreal. 
the Montreal Protocol is called. So Canada hosted the ozone solution and we did. And so it's it's been, uh, that was solved. And the ozone hole has, has since healed itself quite a bit. That was easy. But doing with, with energy, you say, well, you know, oil is the problem. You've got this gigantic industry that's saying we employ millions of people and we're a big part of the economy. You bring us down, we're going to bring you with us. And so, and plus they're supporting politicians with donations. So it's a different animal. So that's why I'm saying, let's not put them out of business. Let's just get some different products out of them and keep them in business. So I hope that might, that might work. But the, the ozone hole is a great example. Yeah. Okay. And one more. And thank you all for all your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, uh, but we'll go to this final question, turn things over to Bob for any closing comments you might have, and then some words from Charlene Peter. I was just wondering with the tidal turbines, mm -hmm. have they done research on how they would affect marine animals yes. and sea life? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, the underwater turbines, the ones that sit on the bottom, they put them in areas where the tidal currents are really, really fast. And the currents tend to scour the bottom. So there isn't much plant life there and there, isn't, there aren't many fish. So the, the, the aquatic life is less in those areas, but they do monitor, and especially in the Bay of Funday, they, they watch the right whales that migrate up and down the coast there. Uh, even shipping, they, they watch out for the whales. But the, that's the advantage of the ones that float on the surface of the water. They don't reach down as far, uh, so they're on the surface. So the underwater ones do not do as well as the new floating ones, so that seems to be the future. But that is a concern. But fortunately, fast moving water does not attract fish. So hopefully that'll help, yeah. Same thing with, uh, with wind turbines. People are concerned about birds. And there's two solutions to that. There's a, there's a big wind farm in Southern Alberta, so near Lethbridge, and I was there. And there was a study on how many birds were being killed by those wind turbines. And they come up with a number. So what they did was they raised the speed at which the turbines start up, the wind speed. So they wait until the wind speed is higher. And again, birds don't fly at high winds. And the, the number of birds they were killing dropped like 60 or 70 percent. And it also works out that more birds, songbirds, are killed by domestic cats than by windmills and by tall buildings than by wind turbines. So, and they, they also are working on, again, I talked in the book, they've had tricks like paint one of the blades black so that it acts like a strobe, you can see it better. And some of them, they put ultraviolet lights on them at night and make them sort of glow purple so the birds can, because a lot of birds migrate at night, make them more visible at night. So there's, there's work in that too. Yeah. Okay, well, listen, thank you so much, everyone, for coming here tonight. You've been really excited. Thank you for all the Okay, my my thought is wow. Well, you think? Please, one more big round of applause. For them. This is the back, so I couldn't see who was asking about like how do we make change, but surely this kind of gathering for this kind of evening is one of the ways that we work collectively to understand more uh, in with more uh, information and more texture about the issues the problems and the solutions and i have to say it's just so refreshing to be able to hear you speak so enthusiastically and positively about forward motion because i think if I think I'm not alone in sometimes feeling just almost um, immobilized by anxiety and, you know, kind of despair. And I think when you hit despair for one, you can't, you can't even advocate well. So thank you for offering such a wonderful counterbalance to that. I, I am going out of here feeling steamed up and, uh, ste you yeah, know, steam, that would be a good, um, <laughs> so I encourage you to uh, purchase copies of the book. Uh, Bob will be over at the near the near the table uh, at the table near the cash desk to sign. Um, this is the last gathering we have here as part of Thin Air 2022. Uh, we are thrilled to be here at McNally Robinson, and I would like to just pause and acknowledge that this is an extraordinary hub 
of ideas and gathering and different kinds of stories that allow us to be together in this city. So would you please make a raucous applause for our gentlemen. <laughs> Sometimes we don't quite know how lucky we are that we have this kind of spectacular bookstore and the people who work here love books, love to read, love to advise and uh, support us in these kinds of gatherings. Uh, our festival is at just about the four week moment. So our final gathering is on Tuesday over at Kilter Brewing Company, and we're going to be celebrating folks who won Manitoba Book Awards this past year. So you would be most welcome to join us there for a, for a party to send us off into a new year. Uh, in the meantime, you can visit thinairfestival.ca. Uh, all Many of the writers that we feature this year have submitted short video readings and a sort of little glimpses into their writing life. So it's a great place to explore and, and wander through. So thank all of you for coming and for bringing your, your energy and your curiosity and your concern. Uh, and may we all go out into the world and make this a greener place to live. Thank you for coming, but please do give Bob a chance to get to the to the test before you mob him. So um, we're gonna chase him out of here and then we can all follow. Thanks for coming. <laughs>